Thank you to Patrick for number one, doing the book, number two, gathering us all here. It's really a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to just talk together after making a kind of single contribution to a volume. And thank you to Jacques Ancien for participating in that volume and for, and for being here with us. I was asked to write in the essay uh, I contributed to the book on, on Rancière and Proust. Um, so that is my topic. Um, and it gets a little pointu here, a little, <laughs> it gets a little detailed on that point. So I hope uh, you'll be able to bear with me. Uh, when Rossier writes about Proust, he's of course not doing literary criticism in any ordinary sense. His readings contribute to the ambitious project of reconfiguring the notion of aesthetic modernism, among other things. In mute speech, he focuses on literary modernism, kidnapping key players in the modernist narrative he wants to undermine. He stages another story through them, instead of the usual account that pits an avant-garde refusal of representation against an anterior realism. Ranciere gives us an aesthetic regime of art in a literary affiliation that runs from Victor Hugo and Balzac through Flaubert and Mallarmé to Proust. In his thesis, he rebuilds fleshing out histories that inhabit the altered field he will call historical modernism, not with canonical figures or canonical literary figures, but with a slew of secondary characters, writers, but also dancers, pantomime artists, photographers, sculptors, and filmmakers who perform, quote, displacements in the perception of what art means. A recent essay, Rethinking Modernity, lays out the full political and aesthetic uh, stakes of this challenge to the reactionary politics and misguided aesthetics of the conception of aesthetic modernism launched by Clement Greenberg. One that, cut off from any community, eventually leads to a postmodern disenchantment with art that aligns with Hegel's prognostications concerning the end of art. In other words, it's a life and death matter for art as well as for politics, since the two go together on the level of the distribution of the sensible, which concerns both our cultural and political limitations and our most urgent possibilities. So I sketch this out as a reminder of the full range and depth of what is at stake when Rancière writes about Proust. And to underscore that there are two levels at play when he does, a literary critical level that concerns Proust's writing, and what we could call a theoretical level that concerns the broader project. I find myself in the awkward position of supporting the latter wholeheartedly while having some reservations on the literary critical level. Awkward, an awkward position because as much as one might want to separate those two levels, they seem to me uh, inextricably intertwined. Rancière tells two stories about Proust. In one essay, he gives us an author tempted by two kinds of writing, one governed by fictional logics alone, and the other governed by a logic of fixed truths, the writing of the incarnate word. And finally, waging war successfully against the second through the logic of the first staging a fictional scene that desecrates the premises of incarnate truth and commits Proust to the writing of mute speech. In the other essay, uh, Rancière gives us an author who, faced with literature in crisis owing to its internal contradictions, finds a solution, exposing and sustaining those contradictions instead of trying to resolve them delicately intertwining or, quote, shuttling back and forth between opposing terms. The contradiction in question concerns tensions between form and content, between what Rancière, citing Proust, uh, alludes to as the kind of, quote, gravity of style and frivolity of content exemplified by Flaubert's Madame Bovary. It can be situated on another level in the opposition between Flaubert, the prose stylist, who takes on even the most ordinary material, and Mallarmé, the poet of ideas. The contradiction, Rancière argues, risks subjecting literature to one of two fates, either a collapse out of art altogether into the realm of the ordinary, 
that would be the direction of Flaubert's Bouvard et Pécuchet, uh, or a paralysis resulting from the desire to escape the realm of the ordinary altogether into a realm of ideas, the Mallarmé path. So Rancière argues that Proust resolves this tension by making impressions the material of his novel, since impressions operate both on the level of sensuous form or sensual experience and on the level of meaning, given that Proust treats them as revelatory. Think of involuntary memory. The tension reconciled on this level returns as a sustained and carefully calibrated tension between a poetry of impressions on the one hand and the architecture of the novel as a narrative construction on the other. This tension is acute because impressions in Proust are aleatory. Uh, again, think of involuntary memory. And so ostensibly escape the order of narrative development. Rancière's conclusion is that Proust successfully plays out and sustains the contradictions of literature in the Recherche, revealing to us that literature is a deliberate enactment of its own contradictions without collapsing into one term or the other. Rancière insists on a dynamic interaction between the poetry of impressions in Proust and narrative structure in the novel I quote, impressions delegate their role to architecture and architecture to impression. And he affirms an intimate relation between narrative development and the digressive commentaries for which Proust is famous in the Recherche. Instead of privileging one and dismissing the other, as critics tend to do, we have Vincent Descombes who privileges the storytelling and says the digressions are all idées reçues, and then Anne Henri, who takes just the opposite path. So I agree with Rancière that Proust's novel works by what he calls this shuttling back and forth between opposing terms, between narrative and discursive commentary, or between impressions and narrative. And so I find Rancière's argument that Proust strategically sustains and exposes literary contradictions compelling. What's more, I appreciate very much that Rancière invites us to take Proust seriously without having to buy into either a uh, myth of enchantment of those essences uh, or a myth of disenchantment, which gives us a crazy, neurotic, virtuoso, skeptical Proust <laughs> who we can dip into and kind of sip like a strong liqueur. But I have some reservations about the account Rancière gives of impressions. Um, he writes that Proust is subject to these two temptations, a writing centered on, quote, fragments of life and sensations that are imprinted in ourselves, and a writing of the incarnate word. However, perhaps to shore up an opposition to the uh, position of incarnate speech and its logic of incorporation, I think he seems to abandon the register of fragments of life and imprinted sensations as his argument advances. In the wake of Deleuze's Proust et les Signes, Rancière reads Proustian impressions as a sign, a trope, and specifically he reads it in terms of the trope of metaphor, which he characterizes as the difference between language and itself, that is, between the space of words and what they say. So the notions of sensations imprinted in ourselves, it seems to me, uh, gets lost as the Proustian impression becomes, quote, one in which nothing is imprinted, being the pure work of metaphor. And so the stiff white napkin in Le Temps Retrouvé, in the involuntary memory episode of Time Regained, or the unfolding of those Japanese pieces of uh, paper flowers in the Madeleine episode become, quote, nothing more than the unfolding of writing. So I'm going to call this reduction of the poetry of impressions to writing the first temptation of Rancière, the temptation of the incorporeal body, I'm quoting, the incorporeal body of the wandering letter, the endless chatter of mute writing. 
We might even want to call this something like his formalist temptation, given Rancière's own account of Shlovskian formalist reading, in which he writes, the logic of the work reduced the value of every symbol to that of a trope. The flesh of words makes very clear what is at stake in this temptation, namely a fight to the death against a conception of writing exemplified by the nationalist fascist writer Maurice Barres, who wrote propaganda pieces during the First World War that appealed to the self-evident truths of blood and soil. The status of a fictional logic is crucial to Rancière's conception of the political force of art. I think we've just been hearing about that in a beautiful way. If politics is, quote, an activity of reconfiguration of that which is given in the sensible, only fiction, which operates through the, quote, excess of words Rancière defines as literarity, can open a gap in the sensible, making possible a reordering of the field of common experience. To read Proustian impression as metaphor, then, as, quote, language difference, language's difference from itself, reinforces the fictional potential of the mute letter. But the risk of this temptation is to affirm a certain autonomy of writing that mimes the autonomy of art in Greenberg's account of aesthetic modernism and even suggests a certain medium specificity. Literature, Valéry reminded us, is a machine that makes art out of words. So I think it would be important to consider the effects um, of reading Proustian impressions uh, as metaphor. First, the sensual, sensuous qualities are transposed onto a plane of meaning. Meaning remains free of incorporated incorporation into bodies, but at the cost of losing contact with the real, Proust's petit fragment du réel. And what is more, there's a long history of an idealist reading of Proust, or of art, uh, which tells us that the recherche transports the reader to a timeless realm of essences. And this has held sway for almost a century or more now, and it too appeals to metaphor as the vehicle of this transcendence. When Rancière insists on reducing Proust's poetry impressions to the identity and difference of meaning that metaphor performs, he comes too close for comfort to the idealist, of reading, uh, idealist reading of Proust, from my point of view, which, to my mind, um, is just simply wrong. Um, there's in that famous Matinée des Vermont uh, at the end of the novel, we're used to thinking about the uh, disfigured uh, characters disfigured by age and so forth. Um, and that's supposed to convince us that, yeah, we really need to get out of time because <laughs> it's bad. You know? But on the other hand, to me, the most grotesque figure at the matinee is not, are not those people who are wearing the scars of old age, but it's Odette who like, has an immortelle jeunesse that she has worn on her face for the past uh, decade or two and looks is, is uh, rendered as the paraffined rose. And it's the moment when Proust goes on to uh, complain or to associate her with the Panama scandal <laughs> and, the, and a certain dying world. Um, so that's the first thing, the reduction or the um, evacuation of a certain level of, of uh, sensual experience uh, in favor of meaning. But secondly, and I think even more importantly, to transpose sensory impressions to the flat plane of meaning evacuates the dynamic force of time, which I believe is the real subject of Proust's novel. The absolute is not to be found by escaping time, Bergson wrote in his critique of Kant, but rather by moving more fully into it. Uh, in my imagination, Proust understood this well because this is just what Proust's poetry of impressions does through rhythms of intermittence. And it's also what the architecture of the novel does to the extent that Proust makes anachronism a structuring feature of his narrative, which operates not according to an Aristotelian line of development, but through layers which frequently overlap. Impressions are not, on my understanding, uh, operations of meaning. They're events and they occur in time for someone. 
who receives them. What matters in Proust, I would venture, is not language's difference from itself, but rather time's difference from itself when it is lived. All of this is pertinent to Rancière's broader argument concerning Proust's skeptical art, his writing of contradiction, uh, which is an idea I like a lot, as I, as I just said. Because the way I see it, the recherche is not only concerned with past time and its reappropriation through recollection. In the narrative fictions he constructs, Proust also stages the production of memories, which occur through impressions, tiny fragments of the real. And it's because these live on as memories which act on desire and prompt twists of plot that we have precisely the kind of interaction between the poetry of impressions and the architecture of the novel uh, that Rancière insists upon. So the way I read it, the architecture of Proust's novel does not support a vocation story. Rancière says as much when he writes that the novel simply, quote, defers a truth always already given by the poetics of impressions. And he adds, quote, the door that the story should unlock has been held open by the labor of metaphor since the beginning. The architecture presents narrative fictions held together by the passing of time and the rhythms of perceiving, remembering, and forgetting through which this passing is lived. Proust's novel does not really end. In fact, some people think it doesn't end at all. Many today consider the recherche to be an unfinished work. In the place of an ending, we have the imposing frame that Proust set up when he wrote the Madeleine episode and a number of involuntary memory episodes that he deferred to the end of the novel. This frame passes for an ending, thanks to the mirage of the vocation story, when in fact it mainly concerns the formal mechanics of involuntary memory. The recherche does not conclude with an ending that emerges from and therefore retroactively constrains the meanings of specific developments of the plot. And I think in particular of um, Sartre's La Nausée, when Roquentin is thinking about becoming a writer and he talks about the bad thing about it is that the ending always <laughs> completely determines the meaning of everything that happens along the way. In, in the story, he talks about taking time by the tail. So I think that this frame and this mirage of an ending is really the brilliance of Proust's strategy. The frame enables him to present a kind of free movement within the space it holds open. And I have that in quotes, and I'm alluding to uh, interesting things Francière says in that essay, Rethinking Modernity, when he's um, evoking uh, a notion of free movement as, as a democratic phenomenon. <coughs> So uh, this frame enables this phrase of space of free movement, uh, which Proust treats as indefinitely expandable, which is why we get to this, after the war, we get to this huge book, which is unfinished at his death. He still is projecting pieces he's adding, and he's still adding into it. <clears throat> so that this is so does complicate a bit, I think, the appeal makes to the notion of architecture of the novel, uh, which in the end, I think, simply amounts to fictional construction, which at times borders on improvisation. In fact, I think there are places you can look in the novel in these interstices between the narrative and the digressions where you can, in fact, see uh, the momentum of improvisation happening. So I think there's another way, or I want to propose another way um, to construe Proustian impressions, namely as an imprinting of light or photographic impressions. To read them in this way calls our attention to the way impressions in the recherche activate time, cutting into what we might call the space of time and making it move. Impressions understood in this way give us not the passive time of retrospection, but time as it touches us in passing. 
So if in mute speech, Rancière initially characterizes Proustian impressions as both form and content, sensuous form and idea, to read these impressions as photographic impressions suggests, I think, a temporal version of that same structure. The difference between an event as it happens, perception, and as it survives in memory. This is what Proust's narrator suggests when he tells us the impression is double, not because it includes form and content the way a linguistic sign might, as signifie et signifiant, uh, but because it exists both in the external world and in us. And he rephrases at that point what he had earlier called involuntary memory in terms of impressions that are, quote, réel sans être actuel, idéo sans être abstrait, real without being actually present, ideal without being abstract. Proust's narrator insists on contact with the fictive real that arrives in the flow of time and remains fundamentally suspicious of abstraction. Indeed, this is precisely the problem of voluntary memory that has already turned into meaning. Before I turn to a few examples of Proust's explicitly photographic treatment of impressions, I would like to clarify that I am not construing photography in the sense of Roland Barthes, La Chambre Claire, <laughs> nor am I construing it in terms of art or its other objectivity. I use it here, as I think Proust does, to refer to photographic processes and images that cut across a wide range of histories and technologies, from the daguerreotype to commercial photography, the instamatic camera, and early photojournalism, all of which are to be found in playing important roles in the recherche. So instead of the mute letter of impressions construed as metaphor, we might speak of the blind touch of the photographic impression. Fox Talbot, for example, spoke of, quote, the touch of light on paper. Um, and I just want to emphasize that this does not imply the indexical that Rosalind Krauss has made so much of. The touch is a touch of light and not of something. <laughs> uh, Théophile Gautier, impressed by the image of the Bisson Frère, that the Bisson Frère took of an expedition to the Alps, spoke of, quote, la touche réelle of the photograph. In the recherche, photography does not imply objectivity, and in my opinion, there is no appeal to chronophotography. On the contrary, Proust turns to photographic devices and figures to challenge assumptions about objectivity and stable identity and to interrupt any smooth passage between sensory experience and signification. So to give you some uh, quick idea of this, let me just mention a few photographic moments um, in the recherche. There is, for example, the old photograph, Photographie Tremblée, the uh, out of focus photograph of the girls Marcel perceived on the beach in Alombre des Jeunes Filles en Fleurs, taken when they were little girls. Um, Proust introduces it into the narrative sequence in a way that confounds both temporal relations within the novel and narrative continuity. Because it is flu or out of focus, the photo is of no help in identifying the girls, which is his quest at the moment, uh, but affirms rather their essential unknowability. The description um, of it that Proust gives at great length essentially reinforces the perceptual experience of confusion um, that Marcel had had seeing these girls uh, approach on the beach. There's also the photograph taken of the grandmother, which emits contradictory images, serene and happy for posterity on the one hand, and suffering and sick. Uh, it functions as what I call an intermittent photograph that performs the contradiction between survival and annihilation that Proust's narrator identifies with death, but which is also, as we have just seen, I think the structure of involuntary memory. There is the strange episode of the camera eyes 
when a photograph of the grandmother takes itself automatically in the eyes of Marcel. And finally, the narrator announces that memory is a photographer. It produces memories from impressions according to the photographic time of the will have been. So I could go on and on <laughs> about, about all of those examples and, and many more. Um, so one senses reservations on Rancière's part when it comes to photography. The aesthetic regime of art presupposes in a rather Kantian gesture that there is a particular register of experience collectively recognized as art. And this seems to be the possibility of something like a common world. Photography, however, is exemplairement ambivalent entre l'art et le non-art, exemplarily art and not art. I'm quoting Rancière. Unlike cinema, which, whether through narrative or montage, constructs fictions, photogra photography, for him, at least at one point, uh, is a mere, quote, technology of mimesis. Photography, he writes, quote, realizes art by suppressing it, by turning its forms into forms of life, a formulation that I think echoes the ostensible threat Flaubert's frivolity of content posed in Bouvard et Pécuché, a nullification of art through a collapse of art into the ordinary. A travail de fiction, a working of fiction, is required to establish des relations nouvelles, new relations, capable of engendering something like a sens commun, a common world. This would be Rancière's second temptation, which he calls aesthetic communism in rethinking modernity. That's a sort of um, uh, democracy to come, <laughs> something of, of that order. So I want to propose, uh, however, in conclusion, that it's possible to reinforce the thrust of Rancière's reading of Proust in mute speech and the role it plays in his broader argument by adjusting his account of Proustian impressions along the lines I've indicated. And that such a move is compatible with Rancière's presentation of, quote, historical modernism in aesthesis. Aesthesis is not married to the idea of literature. It engages with, with, with what Rancière elsewhere calls intermediality, a transfer, quote, between ends, means, and materials of different arts, which make possible, quote, new intersections between arts and technologies, as well as between art and non-art. I think it's a really, to me, it's, I, I, I have the feeling of a shift, uh, a shift in Rancière's work from uh, it's a technology of mimesis uh, to a kind of interesting and rich interplay uh, between art and non-art. In his thesis, Rancière's méfiance of photography begins to soften, I think, as he attends brilliantly to the temporal dimensions of photography. So in other words, just what I was, uh, I was uh, sad to find missing <laughs> in the account of, of Proustian impressions is uh, fully um, presented very beautifully in Aesthesis. Um, I'm going to read, I'm almost to the end of my talk, so I'm going to take the time to read the quotes in both French and English because um, it, it, the nuances are important. Um, so photography, Rancière writes in Aesthesis, takes pour objet matière propre le temps. Son travail s'identifie à la maîtrise du temps qui aménage le cadre au sein duquel la singularité pourra surgir. La composition photographique est composition du temps. L'art de la photographie est un art de la forme temps plus que de la disposition des figures dans l'espace. So photography takes for its object and its own subject matter time. Its work concerns the mastery of time that sets the frame within which singularity can emerge, surgir. Photographic composition is composition of time. The art of photography is an art of form time. Uh, la forme temps more than a disposition of figures in space. 
What is more, in his chapter on Alfred Stieglitz in his thesis, the complex temporality of the photographic act opens onto world. So uh, it's the second step, right? So not only photographic concerned uh, with uh, time, but it's concerned with time in a way that touches um, the world. L'acte photographique se définit dans la concordance de trois temps. Il y a l'attente de l'attente qui découpe le cadre d'une possible émergence et celui où cette émergence s'individualise en expression d'une figure dans la lumière. Mais il y a aussi le temps du monde et des hommes dont la figure présente la cristallisation. Attendre est alors la condition pour faire coïncider l'éclair singulier de lumière patiemment attendu avec un temps du monde et de la société. It's good having it in two languages. It gives you time to think. <laughs> the photographic act can be defined as, so defini, as um, the concordance of three times. There is a time of waiting that cuts out the frame of a possible emergence and the time in which this emergence takes individual shape, s'individualise, in the expression of a figure in light. But there is also the time of the world and men of which the figure presents the crystallization. Waiting is thus the condition for making coincide the singular flash of light patiently awaited with the time of the world and of society. So this waiting echoes back to the otium and to um, all the sort of things, many of the things we've been talking about um, today. Um, photography is no longer the infallible mimetic mechanism in uh, as thesis. Uh, a discourse which was this notion of photography as an infallible mimetic mechanism is a discourse established in the context of the daguerreotype and already challenged and mid-century by none other than Eugène Dizderi who goes at great length to show how that doesn't work for the commercial photographer who wants to see himself as an artist. In his thesis, Rancière suggests that we can consider photography to be an art precisely because it is capable of missing its temporal alignment, missing the mark in l'usage de ce qui lui est propre à savoir le temps, missing the use of what is proper to it, which is to say time. Um, il est dans sa capacité, in the capacity of photography, to manquer et donc à réussir la coïncidence entre le temps du regard, le temps de la machine et le temps du monde. It's in the capacity of photography to fail and therefore to succeed in the coincidence in uh, producing or meeting up with the coincidence between the time of the gaze, le regard, the time of the machine and the time of the world. Photography then, in its engagements with time, participates in the construction of a common world that had hitherto appeared to be the prerogative only of an excess of words. Rancière ends his thesis with another temporal miss, the effacement of the historical modernism that he's been constructing. Um, that finds a certain fulfillment in the project of James Agee and Walker Evans, let us now praise famous men. Uh, and that failure, its relegation to kitsch under the impact of Clement Greenberg's essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch, that launched the retroactive discourse of aesthetic modernism that took its place and that Rancière has been unraveling. But before he arrives at this juncture, he establishes a little channel between the two, between aesthetic modernism and as it's canonically taught, as I learned it, we all learn it, um, and this notion of historical modernism. He establishes a little channel between the two by linking the ostensibly documentary writing of James Agee to the canonically modernist writings of Proust by characterizing it, and I love it, as wit mano Proustien. <laughs> On Rancière's account, Proust not only saves literature through the skeptical art, his art, stages the, uh, his art that stages the contradiction of literature, 
he bridges the canon of aesthetic modernism and the historical modernism we've lost sight of, opening up a channel through the temporal shuffle and a path toward lifting the shadow of kitsch. Um, what I was going to do, but I don't have the technolo technological equipment, was end with some clips of The Temptations, <laughs> um, which I do uh, think Proust would have loved. And I do hope if there's a sequel to his thesis, you will include them in it. Thank you. Thank you.